I would stay away from those platforms. And the reason I would stay away from those platforms is because they're what's called closed systems. If something ever happened to Wix, your website is gone. If your business relies on your website, your business could be gone if something happens to Wix. The same thing is true for Squarespace. Get ready to build, protect, and sell your expertise online with the Online Genius Podcast. You'll laugh. We hope you won't cry. But you'll always be informed and prepared so you can have the success you want. Here's your host, Bobby Klink. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Online Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Klink, and I am really excited for today's show because we are going to be talking all about websites. This is something that's on my mind all the time. I'm actually currently in the process of rebuilding my law firm's website. So I'm always thinking about this. I'm always wondering if there's a better way and what I should be doing and what I need to be thinking about in the process. So it's something that I think every entrepreneur needs to be thinking about, especially thought leaders. And luckily, you're not going to be listening to me give you advice on this because who wants to listen to a lawyer talk about websites? Instead, I've got a great featured guest today. His name is Kevin Geary. Now, Kevin is the founder of Six Figure Grind, an online business and digital marketing blog where he teaches men and women how to build and grow a six-figure online lifestyle business. He's also the host of the Six Figure Grind podcast, a weekly online business and digital marketing podcast. He's been building, growing, and running online businesses for over 15 years. He lives in Atlanta, and he's been supporting his family of five solely from his online businesses since 2013. Among other things, he has a website building agency, but his newest venture is called Website Cheetah, and it offers done-for-you website builds for solopreneurs and small businesses who need an amazing and functional site, but don't want to waste their time trying to do it themselves and don't want to hire an expensive agency to start from scratch. So he is a perfect guest to help us understand this very important topic and and concept, and I am looking forward to his insight. So welcome to the show, Kevin. Hey, thank you for having me, Bobby. Glad to be here. Now, Kevin, I am really excited to talk websites because, like I said, I'm in the process of rebuilding mine, so I'm going to like to hear from you about what I'm doing wrong. But before we do that, I always like to ask my guests kind of a little bit about their personal lives to get a, a sense of who they are. And in preparing for the show, you mentioned you were a purple belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. How in the world did you get into that? Man, I've been, I've been in martial arts for pretty much my entire life. I'm a black belt in Taekwondo, and I taught Taekwondo for a very long time. But I kind of got bored with that, transitioned away from it, and picked up Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I've been doing that for quite a while now. And, you know, jiu-jitsu is one of those martial arts that it just kind of grabs you and becomes part of your life. And the people that you train with become kind of like family. And, and I haven't really experienced that in, in other martial arts. There's something special about jujitsu. And, you know, I, you know, I do it, of course, but I also try to, without being too, you know, religious about it, I, I try to recruit other people to at least try it, you know, and see, see what they think. But for sure, if you catch the jujitsu bug, as they call it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a part of your life for a long time. I think it's funny that you said that jujitsu grabs you because if I'm correct, jujitsu is the one where there is a lot of grabbing. And there is a lot of grabbing. grabbing. Yes. There's a lot of squeezing and choking and <laughs> yes, a lot of that. If I understand it, like the, the central concept of jujitsu is essentially that you're kind of using your opponent's motions and actions against them. You kind of go with the flow rather than trying to interrupt it. Is that kind of a big part of it? It's kind of both. It's kind of both. But yeah, they, they call it the gentle art. It's not gentle at all <laughs> by any means. It can be. The better you are, the more gentle you can be and still, and still win. But most people's experience with jujitsu is that it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a little brutal in terms of, but it's, it's brutal in a really fun way and a great way. And the, the best thing about it is that for sure, when you're training and the techniques that you're doing on people and when you're sparring, basically they are kind of animating being able to disable somebody, you know, in somebody's life, et cetera. But the egos are completely out of the equation in really good studios. 
And so it's an extremely safe martial art to train in terms of you're not getting punched in the head. You're not getting concussions, you know, like you would with boxing or kickboxing or Muay Thai or things like that. So it's very safe in that regard. And you get to stop at any time by tapping out. So if you're stuck in, in some sort of position or hold or choke or what have you, that's too uncomfortable, you know, you have control over ending that. And so that makes it really nice where it's kind of like, well, you could have killed me, but we're friends and we stop and we'll start over and we'll do this all again. It's also interesting to me that you said that it's, you know, becomes your family and those things. I know someone, he's not a personal friend of mine. He's a a good friend of my brother's who is, he's a fireman, he's a musician and he practices jujitsu. And so I see on Facebook all the time, I see these things and it very much does seem like his, I don't know if you call them sparring partners, but whoever it is that he practices it with are some of his really good friends. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it just, it creates that. I, I guess when you're rolling around on the ground with somebody and, you know, choking them and, and, <laughs> and all of this other stuff, making them extremely uncomfortable and them doing the same thing to you, you build some sort of camaraderie that's different than in other areas of life. I think that's probably true. But let me ask you this. I would imagine that there are lessons you take from jujitsu, but also from your other martial arts practices that you can then apply to your business? Kind of what are those and how is it relevant to what you do for a living? Yeah, well, I mean, jujitsu is very strategy-based. It's basically like a a rolling chess match. And so you do have, it is very cerebral and you're doing things for a specific reason. Pretty much everything that you do, especially the better you get, is done for a specific reason. You know, it's not just I'm grabbing the person's collar. It's I'm grabbing a specific part of their collar in a very specific way so that I can create leverage here or control there, et cetera. And that does adapt over into other areas of life and business, especially. I mean, you kind of see what we could call white belts in business, just doing a whole bunch of random stuff and doing a lot of things that are maybe a little cringeworthy. And doing this when it comes to building their website, which I know is, you know, the main topic we're going to eventually be talking about. That would be a perfect example of just their website is a white belt website, you know, whereas if you have somebody who's super experienced, they come in and they're putting things in specific places for very specific reasons. They understand how the user is going to interact with this website. I mean, that's kind of jujitsu, you know, so it absolutely does. You know, Kevin, it's it's almost like you have a podcast to know how to transition to things because, you know, I was about to move to websites. So, uh, you I've know. been podcasting for a long time too. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, well, why don't we start then with, with the white belt mistakes? What are the white belt mistakes that people make, that online entrepreneurs make with their websites? So, I think the first white belt mistake would be, and and, you know, this is a natural kind of thing that beginners in business especially do is they try to build the entire website themselves. And this is something that the square spaces of the world and the Wixes of the world are really encouraging business owners to do. But the bottom line is that if you don't have any experience in digital marketing and you don't have any experience in website design and development, you really don't have a lot of business trying to piece your own website together. I get told all the time by people like, you know, some people don't listen to my advice. So they try to go off and and do their own website and then they'll end up emailing me. I just had one the other day, a guy in, in my Facebook group who was like, I just wasted three hours trying to move some dots around on my website, you know, and this is the trap that so many business owners fall into. And at some point you have to ask yourself the question, is all that time really worth it? How much is my time worth? Like a lot of these same people, when they are billing clients, they're telling their clients, hey, my time is worth $150 an hour, $300 an hour. And yet here they are just wasting hours of their time moving stuff around a website that they really have no business doing. That would be a a white belt mistake, you know? So a white belt in jujitsu would be very wise to, instead of trying to, you know, watch videos on YouTube and become a jujitsu expert on YouTube, would be to like actually get a coach that knows what they're doing and, and, and you know, learn to have them teach you. Like stop trying to do the teaching yourself because you're not there yet. So I think that would be the 
biggest mistake because it's a huge trap for people. They spend way too much time. They waste way too much, really wasting dollars because you could be putting that time into something that's making you money and moving your business forward. Yet here you are clicking random buttons and trying to figure this stuff out on your own. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because when I first launched my law firm, and you know, this was four years ago, and I had not discovered that the the real trick, if you are going to try to build something yourself, is to find a good builder. And so I found just some theme, and I would spend hours trying to figure out coding to move the logo two inches on a yeah. website. And, yeah. and you know, I, I look back on that and I cringe. <laughs> yeah, you know, we can but see I, the smart. I mean, you see the the big. There's there's even it's so in the online business world, you know, there's people who are, I could use probably Pat Flynn as an example, because he talked about this, how in the very beginning, he did the same thing, just wasted endless amounts of time trying to figure this stuff out. Now, he was building his own online business. And, you know, he was bootstrapping everything. He, I think he got to a point where he actually became quite proficient in it. If you look at him now, though, I don't think he touches a single thing on any of his websites. It's all hired out because he understands that even though I can do it now, like I, I know how to do it. I'm capable of doing it. It's still not worth my time. I should just pay somebody to do it and get it done because I have far more profitable things to worry about. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. And I think there are people. And when I was, I'll, I'll be honest, when I first launched my law firm, I didn't have a lot of clients. I probably should have been spending time marketing instead of doing it. But I think what Actually, a lot of people do. And the reason why, you know, maybe some of it is they think they're bootstrapping. But I think a lot of time entrepreneurs want to be busy because it covers up and prevents them from doing the hard stuff that they really ought to be doing. And so I think that's a a valuable point that you made. Now, I know you said people shouldn't do it, but let me ask you this and I'll, I'll move away from it very quickly. But if someone were going to try to build their own website, do you have any pointers for them or do you just say, I, you just don't think they ought to do it at all? Well, I would stay away from, so let's go back to the Squarespaces and the Wixes. So they have, they're, they have brilliant marketing and they claim that this is going to be very easy. And of course, I've seen their, their ads where they have these, like they have actors, like obvious actors, you know, building websites. I think Wix is mainly notorious for this. And it's like, come on, like I know that actor is not building his own website on Wix. Like, give me a break. But I would stay away from those platforms. And the reason I would stay away from those platforms is because they're what's called closed systems. If something ever happened to Wix, your website is gone. Your biz- if your business relies on your website, your business could be gone if something happens to Wix. The same thing is true for Squarespace. WordPress is the platform that I typically recommend for people. And, and that's wordpress.org. It's, not, it's kind of confusing. There's two kinds of WordPress. There's wordpress.com, which is a hosted version of WordPress that would kind of be equal to a Squarespace or a Wix. And then there's wordpress.org, which is the software that you host on your own server that you control or your hosting company hosts it for you. So if WordPress which it's an open source software, which means that every developer in the world can contribute to it. So if there's no, like, it's not going to just disappear tomorrow. But even if like my hosting company were to go out of business, well, I own like my website, I have backup files. I can just take that file, go to another host and there's my website again, right? Whereas like Squarespace, there's nothing to export. You can't, there is no other Squarespace you can move your site to. So if you build in a closed system, that is always a risk. And I just did a podcast on this the other day where you should really focus on everything that you're building that's an asset. You should build it on land that you own. And a lot of people have made this mistake in various ways. Social media is a big one where there's there's a lot of people back when Facebook, where the algorithm was super favorable and they were getting tons of exposure and it was super cheap to buy likes on Facebook and those likes actually contributed to something. They contributed to views. I know people that got rid of their websites and they moved everything to Facebook. Then the Facebook algorithm changed and those businesses vanished overnight, went out of business because they built an asset on land that they did not own. So, Your website is the one thing that you really can own and control, but if you go build it on Squarespace, a closed system, or you build it on Wix, 
That's not necessarily the case. They, they own your website. So, and then we're also in the age of, of censorship, apparently, these days. So who knows that? What, what if Squarespace is like, oh, I don't like what you're doing here on your website. So we're going to shut that down. Or Wix says that, you know, they like this company gets to determine now the state of my business. If you're on WordPress, you're on an open platform, that there's nobody above you saying that. If your hosting company doesn't like your website, fine. I'll take my backup file, I'll go to another hosting company. There's my website again. So you have to keep ownership of your website. That would be the main thing that I would say. So if you're going to do it yourself, don't buy into the allure of these closed systems. Go to WordPress, build your website there. I think that's great advice. And I got to be honest, I went away from Wix a long time ago. I think that was the first one I tried. And my problem was, again, I was trying it a long time ago when hmm. there were all kinds of problems with like their builder was, it was too simplistic. So it didn't actually work right. It wasn't actually responsive, but I've, I've been a WordPress guy for, I guess, four or five years now. But I think actually I want to transition now because I think there's a, a natural transition point here to talk about what is the, the purpose of a website for an entrepreneur? What role does it need to play in their business and kind of what should be the goal of a website? Yeah, so this actually goes into another mistake that beginners make. So you'll hear this, this idea of, I need an online presence. So business owners will say that a lot. Of, and this is probably more true of the brick and mortar business owners. If somebody's like starting an online business, they kind of know that, this isn't the route they want to go. But the brick and mortar shops are kind of like, you know what I just need? I need an online brochure, basically. So they create this brochure website, which typically is, you know, four or five pages and they're all static pages. And it's just like, hey, look at our company. We're the best and you should do business with us. And whatever they would put in a brochure and stick on their desk, that's basically what they put on their website. So I call those brochure websites and that's not really very effective for this age of digital marketing. Like that was the thing back when everybody was told, hey, you need a website, get something up online, et cetera, et cetera. Now the website needs to be much more than that. It needs to be an active, flexible arm of your entire digital marketing campaign. It needs to be a centralized hub. So if you think of your website as a hub, you can think of social media as these satellite properties that you're trying to build, but everything really funnels back into your website. And your website also, instead of just sitting there waiting for Facebook to send it traffic or Twitter or Instagram or whatever to send it traffic, really needs to be earning traffic on its own. And that's the biggest power of your website is in the content marketing realm where you are using the publishing of content to put yourself in front of people who are looking for what your business has to offer. And so you'll hear this, this is basically what SEO is, search engine optimization. So instead of just optimizing for search, like let's optimize my homepage, let's try to do that. Well, it works much better if you use content marketing for search engine optimization. So most people understand this as blogging, where you would write in-depth, helpful, entertaining articles, and you would optimize those, and you would be writing these articles basically to answer questions or provide help to people in your target market. And you get those, basically those Q&A style articles ranked in Google so that when somebody has a question related to your niche, your field, where are they going to go? They're going to go to Google and they're going to type in, how do I do X, Y, Z? And if your article comes up and that's a popular search term, Google is going to dump a ton of targeted traffic onto your website every single month. And those become leads, that becomes sales. So now instead of just having a brochure that sits there that you're hoping people pick up, like you're actively putting your brochure in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. That's really the, the promise of SEO and what a website can be capable of if it's done properly. Well, and I think you mentioned something there at the tail end of that that's really important, and that is that it can generate leads. So I think this is something that a lot of people miss early on. I mean, I have to be honest, I was blogging when I first launched, but I had nowhere on my website to capture a lead, mm -hmm. which I'm guessing that's another one of the mistakes that, that rookies make early on. 
Yeah, yeah. Not building an email list, not having any way to to capture people. I mean, if if you're going the traditional brochure route, what's typically seen is let me put a contact form on there and let yep. me tell people to contact me. Yeah, I did that. My, yeah, and let me put my phone number on there and let me have people call me, perhaps. I don't really like either of those. I actually just did a Facebook Live the other day on why you should get rid of your contact forms altogether. Most of my websites don't have contact forms at all. You really want to direct people into very specific funnels. So if you have a contact form, just think about this from a visitor standpoint. Somebody comes to your website and they legitimately do want information about your service or they want to take the next step or what have you. When you say fill out this contact form, the person's kind of thinking, and, and by the way, go back to understanding that when somebody's looking at your website, especially if it's local, especially if you're a brick and mortar type shop, they're looking at other websites too. They're not just looking at yours. They're comparing you to other people. So let's compare A and B. Your competitor's going to be A. You're going to get to be B, okay? We'll say you're doing it right. Your competitor's doing it wrong. So A, your competitor, they have a contact form. They say, contact us. B your site, you're doing it right, you have a very specific funnel where perhaps they click a button and it takes them into a very specific step like, let me send you this packet, let me send you something, let me get you a set of emails, let me have you schedule a strategy call or an appointment with us with our online scheduler, something like that, something interactive or take this assessment or what have you, right? So in in company A, if I'm the visitor, I'm like, ah, man, a contact form, like, all right, I'm going to fill this out. And then what's going to happen? Like, how long do I have to wait before somebody gets back to me? Is this email that I'm sending you going to get lost in the shuffle? Am I going to miss the email that you send back to me? Then are we going to go back and forth on like, okay, how do I get on a schedule and blah, 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 right? Let's say that's the goal is we're just trying to schedule somebody for an appointment. Okay. So we have the contact form method, which we're going to go through all of that mess versus site B that's like, click this button. Our online scheduler is going to pop up. Go ahead and pick your best day and time, enter your information, and you're on our schedule automatically. That's a much more dynamic funnel, much better option than giving somebody a contact form to fill out where they're literally picking. And I do this with Acuity scheduling. So if people are interested in the actual software that helps to do this, you just go to Acuity scheduling and you sign up for their service. They give you a link to send people or you can post that link on your website and it literally shows people your calendar and the openings and they can click the day, they can click the time, they enter their name, they enter their email address, boom, they're in your funnel. There's no contact forms, there's no back and forth. That's a much better way to collect the lead than saying, hey, fill out this contact form and then maybe something good will happen to you at some point down the line. And then the phone number thing is also very problematic. A lot of people are not doing their research during business hours because they have jobs. So they leave their job, they go home, they eat dinner, then they get online and they're searching for that thing that they need, that they remembered they needed earlier in the day. They find your site and your site, all it says is call us for more information, like a brochure typically would. Well, how am I going to call you at 8 p.m.? Now I got to like, all right, I'm going to call, I'm going to leave a message and then you're going to call me back. I don't know when you're going to call me back. I don't really like answering the phone. I prefer email and text message. Like, so it's just a bad call to action in 2018. Nobody really wants to be answering the phone. So just, I would ask people compare the A version that I explained plus a phone number with the B version that I explained, which one would you rather do as, as a site visitor? Well, so I got to echo that because I have to be honest, I I still have contact forms on my law firm page. I had it from the beginning, but I think I can honestly say I maybe got one person a quarter fill that thing out ever, but I put an online scheduler on my website and people just started popping onto my schedule for a consultation. So it definitely works. Um, And it's much easier for you too. It's not only easier for them, it's easier for you. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't have to go back and forth. I don't have to do any of that stuff. And it's funny you mentioned Acuity. I had Gavin Zaklinski on, the founder, a few episodes ago. We had a great time talking. So I definitely love his software as well. Now, I do want to ask you a question. One question that I have a lot of entrepreneurs ask me or we talk about amongst ourselves is, I mean, are there certain pages that that every entrepreneur should have on their site in in your view? Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously you're going to have a homepage. Now there's a lot of different strategies for how to craft that homepage. And we'll get into 
I'll, I'll give you a specific list of pages and what they should all do. But the main point that I want to get across here for people is that except for your homepage, now you can do this for your homepage too, but other than your homepage, every page on your website should have a single purpose. It should not have more than one purpose. And by the way, that includes not putting little icons and links to all your social media profiles. The last thing you want to do, if we're going to get back into white belt (laughs) moves here, the last thing you want to do is send somebody off of your main property to a satellite location that you don't control, that you have no ownership of. That only benefits the satellite agent. You'll get them at some point. You've got to capture that lead some other way in a property that you own. By the way, you own your email list as well, right? You don't own your Facebook list. You don't own your Facebook messenger list. You don't own your Twitter profile. You own your email list though. Now, once somebody's on your email list, it's perfectly fine to direct them to wherever else. You captured them already. You own them. You're, you're good. You can now send them to Facebook. Don't send them to Facebook from your website. Like that's, that's a definitely a beginner move that you want to avoid. So when I was saying every page on your website has to have one single purpose, I mean, get that specific with it. Like make sure there, there isn't a way off of that page without them either going to another page on your site or taking the action that you want them to take on that page. So on a homepage, I'm a really big fan of let me get them to the right bucket. So You kind of have to understand that everybody who comes to your website is going to fit into a category. Like there's probably for most businesses, like two, three, four, five at the most. If you go beyond five, I think you you really need to start narrowing down and getting more focused again. But there's going to be little buckets that people fit into. For example, in digital marketing and starting an online business, like there's people who have ideas and they're getting ready to launch. Like that might be one bucket. There's people who already launched and they're starting to get traction and they need to know what the next step is. That's another bucket. And there's people who are established and they need to know how to take their thing from five figures to six figures, right? Or from six figures to seven figures. So I have to figure out, and and this is what a homepage is really good for because somebody comes to your homepage. It's like, well, we could go in a thousand different directions, right? Well, don't let them just meander around your site put those buckets in front of them. Get them to choose what bucket they are in. And when they choose that, then you can start giving them the pages or the articles or whatever the next step is that's related to that bucket that they fit into. So you're you're talking to them in a more specific way. So the homepage is really, really good for doing that. After the homepage, we need an about page. Now, I'm bringing up the about page. It seems obvious but I'm bringing it up because most people do it wrong. And I wrote an article on this at Six Figure Grind about a three-section about page that converts like crazy. So an about page is not about you as the business owner. That's the mistake that everybody makes. They're like, I need an about page. All right, let me make an about page. And then they're like, hey, I'm blah, blah, blah. I live in Florida and I have a dog and a wife and nobody cares about you. All right, they do later, they don't now. When they first come to your website, they have, they have no care in the world for you or your personality or anything else. What they want to know is, am I in the right place? Do you understand my pain points? Can you help me? Are you capable of helping me? So that's what your about page needs to start with. It needs to tell them about their own pain points, like reiterate their pain points to them, letting them know that they're in the right place. Then tell them how you're different than everybody else, how you're going to solve those pain points differently than everybody else. So how you're unique. Then you can kind of get into all right, now this is me, right? This is my name. This is blah, blah, blah. These are my qualifications. It's a, this is why you should trust me, basically. But start out with their pain points. Don't start out with, hey, this is me, right? Here's my personality, blah, blah, blah. Start out with their pain points. Then talk about why you're going to uniquely solve those pain points. Then start talking about you at the very end. So if you have an about page that starts out talking about me, 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 I, 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 let's restructure that. So you can make your about page better. The next thing I would say after the about page is a services page. So you definitely want people to be able to see what you have to offer. Never get in the way of giving people of people giving you money. Okay. So let them know front and center what you do, what you offer. 
So a services page is good for that. Now, keep in mind that, if again, if you want your website to kind of sell for you, then you have to go beyond a services page where each service has its own sales page. And that sales page is designed to educate the person and nurture them and get them excited and talk about their pain points, reiterate all the struggles that they're going through and why they really need your service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Have testimonials. So a lot of people might think, hey, I need a testimonials page. Let me just slap all my testimonials on a testimonials page as if like that's the first page that everybody wants to go read when they come to somebody's website. Put your testimonials within the context of what you're talking about. So have testimon- if you have testimonials for, what's your business again? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer, but I'll, I have a legal service, so I, it's hard okay. for me to have testimonials. But uh, okay. we, we can use any, any example. Use someone who does Facebook ad services. Yeah, so if you have a sales page for your Facebook ad services, you would put your Facebook ad testimonials on that page, right? And if you had another service that was different, you would put testimonials for that service on that, on the sales page for that other service. But the key here is it's not like, here's what we offer. And then just expect people to call you and expect people to get on your schedule. Like you have to move them down the line. You have to get the, you have to achieve the no like, and trust factor. But at the same time, you have to actually sell the same way that you would sell on the phone with somebody or in person with somebody in the digital world. You have to do that on sales pages. And that requires time and it requires space. So you can't just, you know, put a services page together and think that it's going to convert. Every service you have, that's a really a main service, a key service that you want to convert people into, really needs its own page and its own strategy for selling and its own calls to action, getting people to, to raise their hand for that thing. So that get on my schedule stuff, like where people have a contact page and they send everybody their contact page. No, 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 put calls to action for getting on your schedule for each particular service. So the person knows like, this is for me. This is the next step I'm supposed to take rather than just going to a generic contact form. Yeah, I think that's great advice on on, on the service page. I think a lot of people make that mistake. They think that, you know, I I just put it, you know, if I make it, they will come and they forget that you actually have to sell people still. Right. that's great. And keep in mind that, you know, we could do the comparison to AB again. If you have site A that just has a services page and then site B has a dedicated sales page in depth for every service that they offer and somebody goes to both sites, which one are they going to end up converting on? They're going to end up converting on the site that sells them, not the site that just puts things in front of them and hopes for the best. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's fantastic advice. So you mentioned three pages. Homepage is about services. Are there any other core pages that you think people need? So you can have the contact page. And I think that it's not, it's not a problem if it's not your main call to action. A lot of people expect there to be a contact page. Now, in the online business world, it's not as prevalent. If you're a brick and mortar, you probably need it just to have it just because people expect it to be there. So definitely put, you can put a contact page, but don't direct all of your calls to action to your contact page. Like get a little smarter than that, get a little more savvy than that. Beyond that, it really starts to get business, you know, dependent. What am I doing? What am I offering? What is the culture that I'm creating? Obviously, if you're a, say a kids, because I I have a lot of kids, right? So I'm always thinking about kids stuff. Let's say you're an indoor kids play place. You're probably going to want a page that's dedicated to photos and videos so that people can see and kind of experience what it's going to be like to come to your place and do business with you. So you might need a page dedicated to that. But beyond beyond those core pages that I just talked about, it's really business specific and it's really what you want to do and what you want to achieve. You can create what are called landing pages or squeeze pages, which are designed to put people into certain funnels. I think it's really important for brick and mortar businesses. They don't do enough of this is using email marketing and not just email marketing, but automated email marketing so that when somebody raises their hand for something on their website, it could be as simple as just a coupon or something. They get into an email sequence that starts to sell them and nurture them, right? Through a specific process. I don't think a lot of brick and mortars or enough brick and mortars are doing that these days. They're not leveraging the power of email marketing. So 
If you want to create certain landing pages or squeeze pages for that, then you can do that as well. And people can see, by the way, if you don't know what a landing page is or a squeeze page is, and at the same time, you want your website critiqued, I do this thing on Facebook Live for half entertainment and for you know half real value for people. I do rapid fire website critiques. So I'll get on Facebook Live and I'll pull up a website and I'll just spend 30 minutes like going through the website, pointing out all the stuff that can be improved in order to, to convert more traffic to leads and sales. You know, and I try to put a little bit of my personality into it and make it entertaining and stuff like that. But I have a landing page for it. So if people are wanting to see what a landing page is or, you know, actually get their website critiqued, they can go to rapidfirecritique.com and you'll see exactly how a landing page works and exactly how you go into a funnel. So you can do the exact same stuff for your own business. You just got to kind of get creative and think about what people might want from you. It's a little bit of a freebie that they can get by giving you some information and then game on from there. Yeah, I think that's a great resource. I do want to ask you some questions about design principles for a second. Sure. Because I think this is an issue that part of the issue that I, I, I keep coming up with is it seems like every time I turn around, there are kind of new trends in website designs. I feel like somewhat recently, it was kind of a single page, just kind of keep scrolling down. And now people have gone away from that and back to pages. Are there trends and how does an entrepreneur keep up with that? So the, the strategy behind your site of like, what do I want the experience of the user to be? And the actual copy that's on the website, the quality of the copy, and the copy is the body text, the writing, right? The headlines, all of that stuff. That's more important than do I do a one-page website there that scrolls down and has different sections or do I do a multi-page website? I think if you look at the conversion rates, you're not going to see much of a difference when the quality of the copy and the quality of the actual user flow of like where you're putting sections, what order or how you're sending people to the specific pages, I don't think you're going to see a difference in the conversion rates. So that's not too much to worry about. A, a one-page website might have some SEO implications. Obviously, when you have multiple pages and those pages link to each other and those pages allow you to have a lot more content, then Google likes that. Google prefers that. So for that reason, I do a, most multi-page websites. Now, if you go to Website Cheetah, which is that the service that I have for for solopreneurs and small businesses to get their website built, that's a one-page website, right? But at the same time, it's an extension of my agency's website. So it doesn't have to be a full website. It's really just looking at your project and, and what's required. You do, if you really want to get the power, leverage the power of online marketing and content marketing and Google and SEO, you really want to get a blog going. And the blog is really, that's where I think beginners can either sink all of their time or really do things right and knock it out of the park and absolutely destroy their competition. Especially if you're kind of brick and mortar and you're doing this on a hyper local basis, you can really dominate Google in terms of local search if you do things the right way. And it, real quick, you know, we can get on to blogging just a little bit. The biggest mistake that people make with blogging is sitting down and thinking, all right, what does my audience want to know or need to know? And I'm going to write about that. Or what do I feel like telling them? Real blogging, if you want to make sure that you knock it out of the park and you want to make sure that you're getting ranked in Google for relevant terms that are going to send you a lot of traffic, blogging starts with research. It starts with keyword research. So most of SEO is research. It's not doing things to your site. It's research, finding out what your target market is actually searching for. So if I find a search phrase that my target market is searching for, and my research tells me that there's 20,000 searches a month for that phrase, and there's not a lot of competition, guess what article I'm going to be writing, right? So instead of like just pumping out articles, article after article after article, just, oh, well, I think this is what my audience wants to know, right? That, that's hit or miss, big time. You can, you can waste a lot of time doing that and get really frustrated doing that. If you do your proper research 
and then you write the articles based on that research, your hit rate goes through the roof and you fairly quickly, now fairly quickly in terms of Google means like six to 12 months at least. But once you start to get traction in that regard, literally Google just dumps traffic onto your site, like targeted traffic that absolutely turns into leads and sales. So that's one of the most important things that people should not leave out. They really need to get into that. So you can have a one page website and then a blog attached to that. Or you can have a five page website and a blog attached to that. But seriously, if you want lots of targeted traffic, you need to get into the blogging game and do it the right way. I think that's great advice. I know that my blog is what gets me most traffic. People find it through Google or however else they're searching. I mean, one other issue on design I did want to talk about, and this isn't structure so much, but I know a lot of people, and luckily I think I don't have this problem because I'm a minimalist, but a lot of people want to put a lot of bells and whistles. Mm. Is that good, bad? Where's the line between, you know, that's just right and that's too much? So finding the line, if you don't have any graphic design experience, you can really miss the line very easily. There are some graphic designers who can have 10 elements on a page and it looks amazing and the user experience is not harmed in any way, shape, or form. And you could take someone who's not a designer and put 10 elements, not the, the same 10 elements, obviously, but put the same number of elements on a site and it looks like complete trash and it's chaotic and nobody knows what to do when they get there. So it's not an amount of things that goes onto a page that's make or break. It's what are those things and why are they there? And are they there on, on purpose or just because you thought it was going to be great? What I would say for non-designers is really just stick to as minimalist as you can possibly get. The quality of the copy, going back to this, which is another mistake people make, they write their own copy. They're not copywriters, just like they're not designers. They're not copywriters. They don't know how to write great copy. A copy that converts, you know, that yes, okay, you know English, you know grammar. It's that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about influential copy that actually moves the needle and gets somebody to be not just a, a website visitor, but a prospect, a lead, a sale, etc. Right. So the quality of the copy and then the images that you decide to use, images online, images and video are very important because. They create emotion in people and they help draw people into the copy that you actually want them to read. So if you're going to use images, if you're going to use stock photos, for example, like take a lot of time to don't pick cheesy stock photos. Like that's a, that's a huge no, no, another white belt move. Like pick really high quality stock photos that really speak to your target market. And this can be a matter of like, let's say you're planning out a page and you are trying to find a, a hero image. That's like the main header image. And you want to find an image that really resonates with your audience. Well, let's say you have a bunch of people in your target audience on Facebook. Pick three photos that you're going to choose. Go on to Facebook, drop them into a post and say, hey, this one's A, this one's B, this one's C. Which one resonates with you most? And have people vote on it. Or go into Facebook ads run three ad variations to that page with the three different photos and see which one gets the most engagement and clicks and then use that one on your page, right? So there's various ways to do this, but actually like put a lot of thought into this. Make sure your images are very high quality because that is going to communicate the quality of your brand just as the overall quality of your website does. If somebody comes to your website and it kind of looks like trash, they're going to assume that you know, well, this isn't a really serious brand. You know, if it was a serious brand, they would have a pretty good looking website. So really quality images, quality videos as well. Videos can really convert if they're done right. You know, you can make a really poor video and make things worse on yourself. So that's kind of where testing comes into play. Like, does this page convert better with a video or without a video, with an image or without an image, with image A, B, C, et cetera. So Good website designers, good agencies, they're going to be doing A-B testing and stuff like that for you at some point. But yeah, it's, it's keep it simple is the best way to go. So high quality stuff. And then in terms of your writing, if you're not hiring a copywriter, just write like you talk. Don't write like you're, you know, taking an English class and you're turning in a paper and, you know, you're trying to get graded. So, you know, change the tone. Also, the length of the paragraphs is very, very important. I was actually just doing an accountant website on one of these 
rapid fire website critiques the other day. And I pulled up the homepage and I started to scroll down. And the first thing that I was met with was seven paragraphs of text. And each paragraph was like eight sentences long. It was like a wall of text. And I was like, <laughs> Nobody is going to read this. First of all, nobody is going to read this. It just like, that is a barrier that tells people, you know what? I got better things to do. Like I, I need to go somewhere else. And so like, if you go read my blog articles on Six Figure Grind, or really anybody that's doing blogging really well, or when you go to their website, you read an article, you're going to notice that the paragraphs are usually like one sentence, two sentence, maybe three sentences max long. Like they're really, really short. Use a lot of headings, use a lot of bullet points, use images within your body copy. You know, if you're talking about stats, use a little graph, you know, to help talk about the stats, something that's visual, something that's engaging. Nobody wants to read a wall of text. So that's one of the hard parts of, remember when I, I was talking about the services, having a page dedicated to each service, I'm not talking about a page that's just a wall of text trying to get somebody to read it like it's a book. I'm talking about like laying it out kind of visually and making it engaging and appealing so that somebody reads that first sentence and then they find themselves kind of like pulled into reading more. If you talk to copywriters, that's really the goal of the headline in copy is to get people to read the first sentence. And the goal of the first sentence is to get them to read the second sentence. And the goal of the second sentence is to get them to read the third. And it just goes on and on and on. That is the sole purpose of each thing. So when you're making a page, that's really how you need to think about the, the copy. You know, Kevin, this has been fantastic. This is really, although we talked about websites and we're talking in, in the context of, of a website, I think listeners, you need to appreciate in many ways, you've just gotten a master class on marketing writ large. And there's a lot that we, that we didn't cover that, that Kevin didn't talk about, but there's definitely a lot of nuggets of just gold that he's given. And, and Kevin, I want to thank you for that because that's been fantastic. We have gone a long time, so I think I'm going to try to wrap up now. But before I do, I want to ask you a couple of quick questions I like to ask people. And one, since you are someone who does online marketing more generally, my listeners tend to be folks who are starting out or in early stages of online marketing. And so what I would ask you to think about is what is a piece of advice you would give them on something they could do, say, either in five minutes a day or maybe something they could have done by the end of this week to improve their business and to really start to, to get some traction in their business? So I think now this is, you know, if you have an online business, this might be a little bit more difficult. Maybe not. I don't know. It depends on the reach of kind of your social channels and such. I think the best thing that you could do, aside from having somebody who knows what's going on, you know, critique your actual website, which I said, like, I'm not selling website critiques or anything. Literally, if you go to rapidfirecritique.com, it's 100% free. You could get that, but what I would recommend you do is find five people in your target market. And if you have a brick and mortar and these people are people that you can get with in person, literally take a laptop and go sit down and have them go through your website and sit right next to them and watch what they do, watch what they click on, ask them a whole bunch of questions, like find out as much as you can about their experience using your website and tell them to be 100% honest with you. Tell them, you know, if they don't like something on the page, have them blurt that out. If, the, if, if your call to action is contact us and they, you know, ask them what they think about that. Hey, what do you think about just filling out this contact form? Like what goes through your head when I ask you to do that? That kind of stuff. If you're online, just have an online business, you can reach out to your social channels, find five people who are willing to screen share with you. Hey, will you get on Skype with me? Let me share my screen. I want you to go, or actually you share your screen because you're going to be the one going through my website. I just want you to go through my website like you're a visitor. Now, what you cannot do, do not do this. Everybody does this. Do not do this. Do not ask your family members to do this. Do not ask anybody outside of your target market. Their opinion matters zilch. They don't understand your market you're not talking to them, your services aren't for them, all of the feedback that they're going to give you is trash. The only people outside of your niche that you can ask for advice is a digital marketing expert. That's it, okay? Otherwise, find somebody in your niche and sit down with them. And then beyond having them go through your website, 
I would probably spend, you know, if they're willing to give you the time, spend another 20 minutes with them, just asking them about their pain points, asking them in, within this niche, you know, I'm not talking about like, hey, how's your marriage? Like I'm talking about actual within your niche. So, you know, get, just extract as much information as you can from them and then translate that into your website. Like when you do these interviews, you have to pay attention to the words that people use and the way that they describe things. And if you do this with five people or 10 people, you're going to see some overlap. Like people use the same terms or they describe things in the same way. Well, guess what? Those exact descriptions, and I would actually like record these so that you can play them back and listen to them. Don't just take notes. Those exact descriptions, those exact words that they use need to go on your website, right? The copy that you write, if you're not a copywriter, the way to cheat is find the people who you're trying to help and use their words and their tone and their language and just put that on your website, right? That's going to get people to convert. So that would be if you, if you could just spend, you don't even need to do five, 10 minutes a day. Spend 20 minutes a week. Talk to one person a week and do that for five weeks or 10 weeks. And as you learn more, you're going to know exactly what tweaks you need to make to your business to start moving the needle forward. I think that is fantastic advice. And, and listeners, it may be a bit uncomfortable at first. You may be like, oh, I don't want to do that. But what I will tell you is when you do things like that and actually interview, talk to your ideal customer avatar and get their feedback, you're going to learn a lot more than just guessing. So, Kevin, I think that's fantastic advice. Now, I do want to talk a minute very quickly about Website Cheetah. And the reason I want to talk about it is I went on there and it looks like an amazing service to me, Kevin. And I'm not just saying that. Basically what you do, and I'll let you describe it a little bit more, but you have kind of, I think it's three packages or four packages, depending on if people want three pages, four pages, or six pages on their website, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And you basically are going to set it up, get information and build it all in one day. And they look like stunning sites to me. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so who is that product? It's targeted to solopreneurs and small businesses, basically? Yeah, it's people who, like we talked about in the beginning, they kind of probably have an urge to do it on their own and to go to the Squarespaces and the Wixes. But at the same time, they recognize that that's not my wheelhouse. My time is much better spent doing other stuff. And besides, when, when it's all said and done and my website is live, do I really want something that I hobbled together? Or do I want something that's built by a professional team with digital marketing experience and knowledge? Because that's not, you're not just getting a website. The whole process of working with us, a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about in this interview is stuff that we're going to be discussing about how to actually convert people that come to your website. This isn't just about having a brochure for your business, right? It's not just about, you know, putting something online and having a web presence. It's about creating an asset it's going to take traffic and convert that traffic into leads and sales for you. So it is completely done for you. And that is the, the trick of it all is that we build it in a single day. And the way that we're able to do that, I'm kind of changing the game of web development the way that agencies do. Like the technology for building websites has changed so dramatically and agencies have not changed. And the reason agencies haven't changed is because agencies are always interested in driving the price point up. And they want a minimum in order to do this big, drawn out, overkill process, which is fine for big companies. If you have a big company and you need a big website, you need to go the agency route. That is overkill for most solopreneurs and small business owners. The agency doesn't have anything in the price point for that. So they're always saying, well, everybody needs an overkill website and we're going to put everybody through the overkill process. So we're going to spend weeks and months developing this website for you that really you don't know how to use yet or you just don't need. It's, it's way too convoluted. So we're changing the game of just changing the entire process of how web development is done. So when somebody signs up, we send them packet and they tell us all about their business. They give us all of the assets up front so we're not you know, running around, going back and forth, trying to get the stuff that we need. When everything is in place, we have your build day and we actually work with you on the build day. Like You get to watch us build the website live so we're making tweaks in real time and it gets done like that. And you have a website that's live and launched and working for you. And so it's 
it's very painless. Yeah. And one thing you didn't mention that I know. So once, once it's built listeners, it's, they turn the keys over to you. It is built on WordPress. As I understand it from Kevin, it is a visual builder that you get access to. So you, you know, going forward, you can maintain it yourself, but you will have an out of the box, not just a beautiful site, but truly functional. Is and customized. Be- Absolutely. Customized yeah. Also. To exactly what your business needs and the, the look and feel that you want to achieve, et cetera. But yeah, you hit the nail on the head is that if, if the Squarespace thing interests you, then this is exactly what you're going to get after it's built for you, right? You're going to be able to go in and use a visual editor to make little changes that you want to make. So you don't always have to come back to us and say, hey, I need this moved and I need that changed. And it's, it's in your hands if you want it to be. If you don't want it to be in your hands, some people don't want it to be in their hands. It doesn't have to be, but it is, that is available to you. Kevin, this is fantastic. You've given some great advice. And for that, I say thank you. You've mentioned a couple places for people to get in touch with you. Obviously, if someone's interested in in this website build, I think it's just, is it websitecheetah.com? Is that where they find that? Yep. Yep. That's it. And otherwise, if they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to to kind of reach out or to find you? So sixfiguregrind.com, no dashes, slashes, or any other stuff. Just sixfiguregrind.com is the best place to go. And I have a, if people really want to get into it, I have a daily email list. So I email every single day to my list, super valuable insights and such. So I would get on that if you arrive at Six Figure Grind, because that's where you're going to get an absolute ton of value. Listeners, we will have links to all that in the show notes, but I definitely encourage you, if you're thinking about a website build or a redo I would definitely check out website Cheetah. It looks amazing from my review. So Kevin, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. And listeners, stay tuned. I will have a quick legal lesson after the break. And now for today's legal lesson. Yay! Hey, Kevin had some really great advice on building your website, whether you're going to do it yourself or work with a professional. He had some really good tips and tricks, and I hope you'll find those useful and implement them as you're building your site. In today's legal lesson, I want to address a quick topic, which is what are the policies that you need to include in your website? Now, if you go to most websites and you go down to the bottom, the footer, you'll see links to three different things a terms of use or a terms of service, a privacy policy, and then something called a disclaimer. Now, some sites don't have a disclaimer. Some sites don't have any of these, and that's a mistake. From a legal perspective, you need to have these policies in place. Now, you could put your disclaimer in your terms of use if you wanted to and and, and do some things like that, but fundamentally, you need to have these different policies on your site. And I wanted to talk about what each one of them does, their purpose, what to include, etc. So let's start with the easy one, which is a privacy policy. And I say easy, it's not necessarily easy to develop, but it's pretty self-explanatory. The privacy policy is defining what information you collect from your users and then what you do with it. So this will generally include things about the information that you affirmatively collect. So email addresses, names, any other kind of information like that, and what you're going to do with that. But then also we'll disclose that, you know, other things that you're automatically collecting. So things like that you use cookies or a Facebook pixel or Google Analytics codes and similar types of tracking information to track website activity and internet activity of users. So it's important to include things like that to disclose it. This has always been important. It's always been useful. There are certain states where that legally require any website that is delivered to anyone in that state to have a privacy policy. California is the clear example. So if you have a website that someone from California is going to visit, you've got to have a privacy policy. It's going to become more important moving forward with what's called the GDPR, which is a new privacy regulation in Europe that goes into effect in May of 2018. The important part of that for an online entrepreneur's perspective is that you have to clearly tell people what you're doing, what you're doing with their information, et cetera. And so having a good privacy policy is a a crucial piece of your website. So make sure you get one of those in place. Now, then the next issue 
that I mentioned that you're going to need is a terms of use or a terms of service that's kind of used interchangeably. You can decide which one you want to use. I call it a terms of use. Now, a terms of use, what it is, is think of it as basically the basic rules of the game for your website. It's the fundamental agreement of what you're saying you you can do and, and won't do, but also what your users can and can't do. So you'll have things in there that might, for example, limit use. Unless you intend your website to be used by minors, you would normally just put something in there, for example, that says that the website is intended to be used only by people 18 and older. And you would put things like that, but also put any prohibited uses that your website can't be used for X, Y, and Z if you have certain limitations. You'll also have a lot of things that are pretty boilerplate. And by boilerplate, I mean just a standard clause that will be in just about everybody's policy. So things that might fall in this category is a, a statement about intellectual property rights so that you know you maintain the rights to the information, et cetera. You'll generally have something that says you're not making any warranties about the information and that you're limiting your liability in certain ways. And you'll also generally have a clause that sets out where and how any dispute is to be resolved. So do you want it to be done in court or do you want it to be done through some other method, primary one being arbitration? And more importantly, where the dispute will be resolved, which you would generally set as your home court. Now, that's the general stuff, but then there's the stuff that's specific to your business. So if you have specific limitations because you give them freebies and those freebies are to be used only in a certain way, let me give you an example. Let's say you have a paid product and a form that you give to people, and that form, let's say, is only intended to be used by a single person for a single business. Well, you would put that kind of limitation in your terms of use. You, you put those things in. You would put your refund policy in. If you have any kind of subscription model, you would explain how someone can cancel their subscription. If you do affiliate links, you would generally mention that you have affiliate links in your website. If you sometimes get products for free or at a discount to review them, you would mention that. Other things that you might want to think about, if you have guests on your platform, whether it's a podcast guest or a guest writer on your blog, you might want to put something about, hey, we can't control what they say. And so, you know, we can't verify what they say. That's their information, not ours. You do often a similar thing about links. You know, hey, we link to external content. We think it's good, but we don't control what happens there. So there's just a lot of stuff that goes in there, but that is the basic rules of the game. And this is a document that really does need to be tailored for your business. So if you have an e-commerce business, you're going to have one kind. And if you have a coaching business, you're going to have another. And quite honestly, it's the kind of thing that even within coaching businesses will need to be personalized because your coaching business is not the same as someone else's coaching business. So that's the terms of use. Think of that as the written agreement between you and your website users. And then the final document or policy I mentioned is your disclaimer. Some people will fold this into the terms of use. Some people have it as a standalone. If you don't have a big need for this because you don't think it's a huge need for your business, you should at least fold a generic one into your terms of use. But a disclaimer, think of it as having two major purposes. First, for someone who is providing anything that could be construed as advice, whether it be me providing information about legal issues, a health coach providing information about that, a fitness coach, someone who who is a, a financial advisor providing financial information, anything like that, you're going to want to put a very express and explicit statement and a disclaimer saying that you are not providing advice on the website. You are providing information and educational information. I think mine, for example, says that I'm not providing legal advice. I'm providing legal education information. The reason for that is you don't want there to be some argument by somebody said, hey, you gave me this advice. I followed it. And therefore, you know, it hurt me. I'm going to sue you. Now, you will often also have a statement in there that says that the information is not a substitute for advice from someone who knows the person's particular circumstances, et cetera. So 
you'll generally want to have something like that. And if you provide anything that could be construed as advice on your website. Now, the other piece of a disclaimer is what I call the FTC part, the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission requires you to have disclosures, for example, about any kind of testimonials. This is the the stuff you'll see in fine print if you ever watch an infomercial about results not being typical. Well, it's the same thing for your website. So if you have testimonials, you're generally going to want to have a few different pieces in here. First, you're going to have a statement that says, you know, is it a verbatim, someone said exactly this, or is it verbatim, but you corrected grammar or whatever, you're going to describe that. So if it's simply verbatim, hey, these are verbatim testimonials provided by customers. But then you're also going to say, but these, you know, are not typical and there's no guarantees that your users will get similar results. You need to do that because otherwise, let's be honest, your your testimonials will tend to be the people who do quite well in your program. And so you don't want the people using your website to say, hey, you told me that this person made $50,000 and I didn't, and then sue you as a result. So you're going to have a disclaimer in there to make sure that that's taken care of. So that's what your disclaimer is. So again, as you're setting up your website, whether you do it or you have a web developer do it, you're going to have to create these pages because web developers aren't going to create them. They might have stock for you, but you're going to have to be careful. So make sure that you create three different policies. Each one will have its own independent page on your website. Generally, they'll just be linked to in the footer of your website. So you have your privacy policy, which says, hey, what information do we collect and what do we do with it? You have your terms of use or terms of service, which is the the rules of the game, defines the proper use and improper use of your website, and then other things, a lot of boilerplate we talked about. And then finally, you have your disclaimer. You put those in place and get them in place from the, the outset and just make sure that they're on your website. And that way, your website, you're not going to be running into legal problems because of your website. So that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Again, if you did, I hope you'll subscribe and also share and and get other people listening. I want to get this information to as many people as possible. Got another great show coming up next week, which I'm looking forward to. And until next time, this is Bobby Clinton signing off. Thanks for listening. And remember to visit mistakes.youronlinegenius.com to get your essential guide to the four legal mistakes that can doom your business and how to avoid them. Join us next week for another episode to expand your online genius and your success.